Hello. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Um, so, in a few min minutes, we are going to float in space because this talk that we are presenting right now, it's called Making Music in Space. So, music and space have been like very tied up together since always, from classical music until free jazz and uh, Afrofuturism to techno. There is e even one genre called space rock. So space and music has, have always been together. And almost in every uh, space mission, there has been like astronauts bringing the guitars, their instruments, or tapes, records. Uh, I don't know, like 30 years ago, they even sent a record to space. But how about making music in space with the physical conditions of space, not those from the Earth? So that's what we are going to talk about with these three guys over here, which they have been actually making music in space. We have researcher and artist Albert Barque Duran. Hello. Nicole Luillier, also researcher and artist, musician. Hi. And Marc Marzenit, musician, producer, entrepreneur also. Uh, please welcome them with hands together. Thank you. And, and let's start. So, Albert, tell yeah. us do we, do we about the Zero the Gravity Band. Sure. Ah, perfect. Yes, let us start with, with um, our project uh, about Zero Gravity Band. In a nut we only have 10 minutes to explain, like a project that we've been working on it for one year, so let me go through it super fast. Uh, in a nutshell, the Zero Gravity Band is a project that is a combination of, of art and science. So the way that, that we like to explain it is that the nucleus is, is purely academic, research-based, but then it's kind of wrapped within this really artistic approach. And this last year, we've been exploring a lot um, one issue, because we've, we've realized that it seems that we are again in, in, in the midst of a space technology revolution with this science fiction -y idea, for some people would say, uh, that we have this goal or this opportunity to start traveling outside of, of our planet Earth. Uh, with the ultimate goal of living, maybe in another planet. So we really think that it's time to reflect uh, and discuss what it really means to live planet Earth. And in this case, we want to explore and, and experiment the potential cultural implications of, of that. And I know this is like a really grandiloquent question, so we, we wanted to try to bring it down a little bit. And what we are asking ourselves exactly is what does art mean outside planet Earth? And for that, uh, you will see that we, in, in this project, we are working on two different dimensions, two different approaches. One is how does the production of art changes in conditions of zero gravity and how aesthetic perceptions for us, for humans, change in conditions of zero gravity. So we've been doing research on these two things. And for these days here at, at Sonar, uh, what we are presenting after all these months and doing a parabolic flight, but, but Nicole and, and, and Mark are going to talk more about this, we are presenting a huge immersive installation that I hope you've been there already. If not, you are late. Uh, with this huge uh, special dome from, from Eurekat with, with a really interesting technology, musical technology, but Mark is going to go through it. And what we've been... So the aim of this immersive, immersive installation is to induce the audience, to induce people, sensations of vertigo, sensations of zero gravity. And how could we... How can we achieve that? So we've, we've been designing this protocol, and here you, ha you have some examples, using all the, research, the late and most recent research based on uh, what it's called the vestibular system. The vestibular system is something that we have here behind our ears, and it's the one that is telling us uh, the position of our head 
uh, uh, in, in the environment that, that we are in that specific moment. It gives us this idea of I'm standing up, I'm in this uh, angle uh, within the, the floor and my body. And what we are trying to do in this immersive installation is through two different stimuli, audio and light, manipulate this vestibular system and induce people these sensations of, of, of vertigo. And for instance, you will see that we've been really lucky to work with uh, Play Mode Studio, which, which are the ones who, who have been creating this Luminic installation. And you will see also uh, a little exhibition inside of, of, the, of the installation. We have these zero gravity spacesuits. That, that is something, uh, a collaboration with the ED, the, the European Institute of Design. Mark and myself here are, and, and also uh, Antonia is, is wearing one of these spacesuits. I'm, I'm going to talk about it in a second. Then also we are showcasing the Telemetron from, from Nicole, and Nicole is going to explain you all about it. And also a prototype, if the, the Telemetron is a prototype for an instrument to be played I, uh, and interpret it in, in zero gravity. The SAFNAC, which is the word canvas, but the other way around, is a prototype that allows you to paint in zero gravity. So it, it's again, it's a redesign of fine art techniques and visual, visual arts, and it allows you to, to paint in, 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 in zero gravity. So here you have this collaboration of, uh, with, with YET, and basically, we started from this idea uh, of collecting all the data and all the, the, the results from these labs that they are working on and doing research on how perception of aesthetics change in conditions of zero gravity. We explained all this to these designers, and the designers did these amazing suits, which here on Earth, they look like this, but it's nothing in comparison to how they look in conditions of zero gravity. So it doesn't make a lot of sense, actually, to, to wear them right now. But in the next parabolic flight that we are going to do, we are going to wear them. And then hopefully, you're going to see the, the potential of, of these new designs. And, and this is the SAVNAC. As I was saying, it's a reconceptualization or a redesign of a classical canvas. Not only a classical canvas, but a, a classical paintbrush and paint. And, and in this case, uh, what, what it, this allows you is to create an artwork, an ephemeral artwork, e while you are in, in zero gravity conditions. And it creates these uh, paint spheres that are floating inside of this chamber that you see here, thanks to the superficial tension that, that allows you or that, that it's one of the properties that you find in, in zero gravity. And Mark, if you, if you want to follow. Another important uh, item on the, on, the, on the dome is the, the sound. Obviously, we're talking about uh, making music uh, in space. So in the dome, you can hear a 3D audio system. So it means it's real 3D. It means like the sound come, come around from any directions. It's totally different than. Uh, Atmos or f the typical surround. No, it's it's next point. And what you can hear, it's music I create in actual microgravity, real one. So we actually made a, a well. I need to I need to say that uh, the system uses a software from Eurocat called Sphere. That is this software you can see here. So all the items I create in zero gravity, like a melody, drums, whatever. Then I use this software to put it. Uh, on, a, on the dome and spinning around. So with the protocol that Albert explains, we're trying to create this business. So poetical talking, we're, the, the project or the musical, it's like, obviously, we can avoid gravity. That's a statement. Some people ask to us, are we going to fly there? It's not one or three, probably. Even today, it was a guy, oh, if, I not, if, if I cannot fly, I don't like it. It's like, no, come on, no. <laughs> it's physically impossible. But what you can experiment is with your eyes closed or watching, this feeling we uh, ex like feel in zero gravity, what is like this movement, this kind of pleasure movement. So this software really helps to, 
to translate this message. Uh, a parabolic flight, really quickly, is this flight that uh, describes a parabola. You have 2G, and then in uh, 22 seconds of zero microgravity. This is a flight uh, we flew in Bordeaux. Actually, there's three, only three places in, in the world. It's the United States, uh, 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 Russia, and, and France. So we flew in France. This is the area. And to make music, what is the problem? One of the problems is all the instruments, basically, most of them, they're created with gravity. So the designers, they, they didn't think gravity as, a, as, a, as a, an important thing. When probably the first luthiers created a piano, they used a, a, a weight to put back the key, you know? But they, did, they didn't think in gravity. It was like assumed that the weight would put back the key. But what happens if you we take a normal piano into space? We don't have gravity. So if you press the key, the key's not going to go back. So that's one of the first problems. So, so many instruments, even the techniques, when you play the piano and you go to the classical music school, you use gravity to play. But if you take it out, what happens? Probably your muscles are going to get tired because you need to put do uh, double times. The, the, like the movement, it's more hard. You need to pull up, put down. So it's not. No, a normal piano is not really proper designed to be played in zero gravity. One of the research uh, we're doing in the project is like try to redesign uh, instruments, think how it would be. For example, I imagine like a piano, not like like flat. I imagine like vertical because it's a, like a natural position in zero gravity. It would be really useful. So I just can need to move this. I need to say that it was really amazing when we discovered Nicole that she was explaining about the project, but it was like this. Mommy, like, oh wow, you really did, like go a step farther and make it real. So it's it's really uh, it's it's really important. What I use is a wireless MIDI controller. So how does it work? It's a ring. You put it. So with the movements of your hand, you can control the sound and create and variate melodies, shapes of the sound, cut off. So it was funny because when I contact the company, the company were in shock because they designed this to be played in Earth, well, in Earth with gravity. But when I contact them, hey, can I use it in a zero gravity flight? They were like, what? What do you mean? So I explained the project. They were fascinated. And actually, it works. So this, for me, it could be like a really close element that, as a casualty, it was really proper designed to be played in zero gravity. Here you can see one of the experiences. Uh, besides the ring controller, I use a, a regular a MIDI controller to experiment who was to play Classical uh, keyboard. Uh, this picture is probably most of you saw it in no, in media, in yeah. media, whatever. It was really hostile. I don't know. It's something uh, we talk also with Nicole. When you're in a zero gravity flight or when you're in a zero gravity environment, it doesn't mean it's a zero gravity flight in space in anywhere that you don't have gravity. It's super hostile. Whatever you want to try to do there, it's so hard, and it's sometimes it's so frustrating. Um, it can look awesome, the picture, and so many people, oh, Mark, oh, that was awesome. But if I need to say the truth, it was really, really challenging. It was a stressful. It was like, wow. Uh, I didn't have the best time of my life. That's, yeah. that's the truth. You should definitely see the making of. The making of, yeah, no, it's because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because sometimes I fell down because I was so into it, and then the gravity hit me, and it's like, boom, you know? And is it physically painful? Yeah, it is, especially the, before the zero gravity, microgravity, you have 2G. So it means it's twice the gravity of Earth. That moment, Nicole, it's mind-blowing and really. I use the 2G, actually, as an experiment uh, to program drums. So what I realized, programming drums in 2G means when you hit the pad, you hit harder, because it's twice harder as usual on Earth, and you actually can play a little bit faster. It, the, the 2G it helps you to play drums a little bit faster. For example, for a drummer, it would be awesome to play in 2G, because he can quick uh, faster. I'm sure it would help him. Otherwise, for a piano player, it would be exhausting, I think, like all the time. I don't know. In the, and 0G, in general, it doesn't help to any player. There's no instrument properly designed to be played in 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 well now, now yes we have the telemetry well the telemetry that's that's <laughs> yes. for sure and well that was the well that's the partners um, 
I just want to make uh, because we want to talk no later together. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, a little Imagine little. going because it's, if it's making music in space, I want to make like a, a question, a general question to people. It's like, okay, no, uh, people is gonna uh, be able to to uh, to travel around the the, the cosmos, whatever. So. We will have different techniques. So imagine that we, someone is born in Mars, so it has the gravity in Mars. In the future, there would be musical schools in Mars that use the gravity to Mars to sp specific technique. So a musician from Mars, it would be hard to play on Earth. And imagine like planet two um, exits, whatever, maybe if uh, they have twice, it would be totally different. So the interplanetary tours for musicians or bands it would be so, so challenging because it's a really disruptive way and you need to learn uh, these new techniques and get used to. Okay, so let's, let's listen to Nicole's story. She, she has just earned her PhD, like last my week master's. or so. Your master's. I'm doing my PhD now. Ah, okay, <laughs> at MIT. And she's been researching also how to make music in space with a telemetron. So tell us all about it. Yeah, well... Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here, and thank you for, <laughs> for us, everybody being here. It's, it's amazing. I'm really grateful. Um, so my name is Nicole Rillier. Um, I am a sound artist, musician, and researcher from Santiago de Chile. And as Antonia was saying, I'm based now in Boston, working as a researcher, and I'm studying a PhD in MIT Media Lab in the Opera of the Future group. So I work in the intersection of art, music, science, and technology in order to create different uh, experiences and installations. My work, as you can see here, has a lot to do with doing uh, install perceptual installations, experiential art, uh, kinetic sculptures, and everything to kind of like expo explore sound as a construction material, a construction material not only for like architecture or, or spaces, but a construction material for creating also uh, agency and identity. Um, yeah. I like to think about sound also as a tool to breed the material with the material world. So I also work a lot with like non-human agents and the relationship with humans. It, maybe some of you know the Media Lab, but MIT Media Lab is this uh, academic research uh, facility, laboratory in MIT, and we work under the, ma the, the graduate program of Media Arts and Sciences. There's currently like 27 research groups there, and my group, as I mentioned, is Opera of the Future. And in Opera of the Future, we work with everything that has to do with music, sound, and experience. Um, we like to create like different instruments, understanding music as something that connects to each other, and also like as a social fabric in some way that triggers new relationships. So not only instruments, but also collab collaborative uh, compositions, uh, different software for fostering this and creativity, city symphonies, robot operas, like you name it, everything. So I like to think about my work uh, and what we do at Opera of the Future as a art as a tool for change, a tool for projecting futures and for fostering engagement and for opening also new narratives. I'm also part, uh, I'm very honored to be part of the MIT Media Lab Space Exploration Initiative, which is a group where we open up a space, a place to open conversations about democratic, diverse, and inclusive, even hackable space futures. Uh, so we do this through different projects, through experiments, through uh, weekly or monthly meetings, uh, talks, and also through workshops. And in this context, I'm gonna, as we were talking about uh, making music in space, I'm gonna introduce you to the telemetron. So the telemetron is a music instrument for performances in microgravity. It's specially designed for that. Uh, we did it, it's done by myself and my collaborator, Sans Fish, that he unfortunately couldn't be here. Uh, as we were saying, I'm part of like, uh, the Space Exploration Initiative, and we did the, tel the telemetron as part of the first research experimental flight in zero gravity of the research. Let me talk to you a little bit more about the telemetron and what does it mean to do an object like this? What does it mean to create music in space? And what are the implications of this? So as you can see here, this is Sans Fish, my collaborator and dear friend. This is me, and this is the telemetron. This is the telemetron before the first flight. This is the telemetron during the first flight. And this is me and the telemetron, a real love story. But not everything was like fame and glory and fun with the telemetron. So as you may see, the telemetron started on Earth, on gravity. 
So the first stages of the telemetry are basically like this sketch, where, as you can see, it didn't change that much. This is like actually the first sketch of the telemetron, and it's like really, really simple. It's like really minimalistic. It is structure, very, I don't know, like something that anybody could like understand that. It's like, no, it's not rocket science, actually. <laughs> but the thing is like, when, when the magic happens in zero gravity, but then also, what does it mean to do a project like this one? And for myself, that I build different synthesizers and like kinetic sculptures for sound, like, I, we actually like needed to be in tune with the regulations of the Aeronautics uh, Federation, and that was like a lot of paperwork and a lot of work to actually like make things possible, things that are going to be safe and things that actually can work. So this is an example of like some of the engineering behind the telemetron, which is great to be in MIT and be able to collaborate with different scientists and engineers to actually make this happen. These are some tests for the compression. Uh, this is the telemetron before the flight, and as you may have seen, inside the telemetron, there's like these objects that are called the chimes. And inside the chimes, you find this, uh, mic this board, that this circuit board that we specially designed, that has a microcontroller, uh, a sensor, which is like a gyroscope, uh, which has three axes. So we have like each of the chimes has three different values that we can map to MIDI notes. And also a radio frequency to be able to send those values to our computer and actually make all the music, like assign it to any instrument and different MIDI channels that we want. Mm -hmm. And this is us calibrating the telemetron right before the flight. I'm going to ask you now to, I mean, to listen to the telemetron. Yeah. This is a really short excerpt. Just let's say, like, let, let's go for 30 seconds or so because we cannot like extend it too much. Uh, this is actual footage from the first flight of the telemetron and the sounds that we created in these experiments. <laughs> I guess you get an idea. I'm also an ex experimental electronic musician, as you might see. <laughs> uh, but what's interesting about this experiment is that actually, like before flying, we had all these plans and we prepared a lot of like things for the performance. Even like we choreographed some things. And to realize that once you're flying in zero gravity, everything changes. Your body <laughs> needs to relearn how to perceive. You need to rele relearn how to be. In such an alien environment, actually, we are more aware of ourselves than ever. So we are like all the time recalibrating, mm -hmm. re-being in some way. Uh, I love that. I love that it's like, like, I don't know, when things fail, but they open like new possibilities. And actually, I love also to understand that beyond this, like creating culture and, and expression in outer space, we become matter. And we enter in another dimension where humans <laughs> and, and matter need to relate in a more transversal and intimate way. And things, I mean, in zero gravity, things come to life. And things are like more vibrant than ever. So this is how like the telemetron, more than only like a experimental composition or performance in outer space was a dance between human and no human bodies. Can I, can I say something? The first time we Skype with uh, <laughs> El, uh, Nicole and she said that and we say we experiment the same. We, we felt a huge connection. Ba Barcelona, Boston, but yeah. like, <gasps> we felt like, wow, it's like, you yeah, know, we, we like totally we were connected. Like, <gasps> we're like, yes. Yeah, <laughs> you happened this. We experienced that. It was yeah. magical. It's crazy. Well, and just like to sum up, like, then it's like the big question for me, like, the most important one is like, why? Like, why and what's the purpose of all this? More than, I mean, why, right? 
So I like to think about art as a tool to reshape our cognition and challenge ways of thinking. A project like this one and others that we're developing right now um, allow us to explore new models of perception and how to relate with the world and other agents around us. Um, I think, I really think that it, it's super important and interesting to think about new scenarios on how multisensory gravitational perception can change the production uh, of knowledge and also like trigger unknown relationships. And the main objective of this project is, uh, is to actually start thinking about the production of culture in outer space as, as here like the zero gravity band is also thinking. Uh, like we know that through art and expression, we can create more inclusive and diverse space narratives that can actually change our, our future by changing our present. And most important, we need to think about a space for everybody, a space to share, a space to create, and a space to listen. So, thank you very much. <laughs> I would like also to ask the question why to Albert and, and Mark, why making art all in these. space? Why yes, all these? why? Why the space? Why a parabolic flight? Why, yeah, why leaving Earth? I think everything started last, last year when I was premiering the last project that we also were collaborating already with Mark, which was my artificial muse. And we were presenting it also here at Sonar Plus D. That we, we were exploring in, in, in that occasion another big question that we are facing as a humanity, and it was which way can we, or how, we, how can we collaborate with, a, with AI, with artificial intelligence, during creative and artistic processes. And once we finished that project, which we consider that it was one of the challenges that we are facing right now as a society, we thought, okay, what is another one of these big questions that we are facing right now. And, and, and I thought, wow, I know, again, it sounds really science fiction-y, but it seems that um, this idea of traveling outside planet Earth and going to live to other planets, it's something that we can squeeze a bit and see what's going on or trying to explore a bit. And that's, well, as a, as a funny thing, the <laughs> first time that I explained the whole idea to Mark, he came to, to my place, and I explained his idea, and, and the reaction from Mark was... I was laughing. Laughing for two minutes nonstop. Crying. <laughs> I was crying because I expect we had a meeting and, uh, about artificial music, and said, I have this idea, you know, hope art in space, and he showed me like a picture about everything, and I started to laugh, crying and say, this is awesome. And then immediately, like, it hit us so hard. So we start researching, researching constantly. Because it's something that, for, is, for some of you, is the first time you think about. The first reaction of everybody is like, oh, well, this is cool. But when you're going to go home, stay is, is, a, is, a, is a thing that hits you so hard. And it keeps you so many questions constantly. It observes you. It gets you into, wow, future. And it's really passionating. I don't know, but I think if some of you is the first time you think about, Really, it's, it's not going to be the last time. Uh, actually, it's like a reality that we can go to space, or at least close to space, with that kind of parabolic flights that you have made, uh, that you have tested your, your prototypes. Uh, you say that for a few seconds, you're in condition of microgravity. For a few seconds, you're in conditions of hypergravity. In total, for how many seconds or minutes you are able to play your instruments and to try them out and to see if the whole thing works? In total, it's like four minutes. Yeah, four minutes like and in 50 total. seconds. Yeah. 22 yeah. seconds times 15, 16 parabolas. So. Yeah. Which is very challenging. Yeah. To actually, because, I mean, at least for me, and I guess, no, 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 for uh, the first parabolas were mostly like, oh my god, like, you know, like, and also like you saw the video that we made. Like, we were like, yeah, we're going to do this, like, like, film, like, a documentary about this process and everything and then we were like trying to look cool and like yes I'm playing the telemetron but it's like oh my god <laughs> so it's like like super like uncool faces it's like it's like a amusement park in some way because you are just not prepared and everything is super fast and it's it's just amazing I love that it. it's mind blowing yeah. but it's really fast yeah wh one of the thing a statement I want to say also is like it seems crazy like uh, music in in space like so futurist but Virgin Galactic is flying with the, the, her first uh, their first uh, 
a tourist space flight this year. Uh, Elon Musk is doing a revolution, Jeff Bezos the same. They expect the first hotel in space in 2021, colonization of Mars in 2030, and as a, a joke, bonus joke is reality, NASA expects to be born the first human in Mars in 2060. So that's, it's really already happening. So it's not science fiction, it's, it's a reality, but maybe it's not trendy yet, but it could be in the following years or maybe end of the year. Mm -hmm. And, and Albert, you're, you have studied a PhD in cognitive science, so I guess that this project is a bit like part of your research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how is it, do you have an idea of how is it going to be culture when humans go finally to space? Not just astronauts, but people like you that you have already done, kind of, and maybe people like us that for now we are just listening to you like in awe, like really? Is that possible? Will we go to space? How will life be? How? This, this research, like how zero gravity impacts our cognitive system or psychologically speaking, speaking, this is something extremely new. So now, like there are some labs that they are starting to, to do proper research on it. And for instance, it was one of the main pillars of our project, the collaboration with the with, uh, Elisa Ferre, who is the director of the VEME Lab at Royal Holloway. And, and it's amazing already the first studies that they've been doing on as how preferences and judgments of aesthetics change in these specific conditions of, of zero gravity. And in a nutshell, it seems that we are kind of obsessed with this idea and concept of verticality. It seems kind of obvious now when you, when you make this comment a posteriori, but it is not. Now Now it's, we, we are showing that, yes, through this, this natural evolution, of course we are obsessed with vertical lines because that's the only way to construct things here, to build up, uh, to build up things here. So if, you, if, they, if you want them to, to, to not, not them to break, to, break it, to break them down. And this happens also when, when you perceive all the things in your, uh, in your environment and the aesthetics. And the fact of losing this verticality when traveling to other, other places, then it changes, obviously, all, all, all your perceptions and, and, and aesthetics. Mm -hmm. of, uh, also, uh, music or sound as a physical thing, of course, behaves differently in different atmospheres and in different gravitational conditions. How do the instruments actually sound when you are there? Do you hear them? Or what happens? Like you are playing the telemetron, you are hearing the telemetron or no? So and if you do, <laughs> how does it sound? The plan was to hear it, but the, the plane is super loud. Yep. But then there's like people that thought ahead of that, like Mark, and he went with headphones actually. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> uh, so we kind of like we're controlling this instrument and listening like, ah, some things are happening, not everything. So to be honest, like that first flight was more to, 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 to realize all these constraints and what does it mean? And like now we need to like continue doing these flights and continue developing new instruments and, and some variations. And actually like in, the, in a second flight, we can like actually deploy perfectly and really understands uh, the, how to augment the expressive capacities of the instrument. Now with sound, specifically towards the medium, in zero gravity, like sound doesn't differ that much. I mean, it's the, the medium itself, it's still the same air, air, air we breathe uh, and we communicate and, and sound travels ber like just us on Earth, let's say. What does change a lot, it's like in outer space. So in a different atmosphere, like a completely different medium, I mean, it's like vacuum. Um, I've done a lot of uh, other artistic projects with, with un understanding like vibrations and silence, and it's actually like, uh, yeah, like outer space art. This is more like zero gravity art. Yeah. But which is interesting is like now you can create like very strong uh, protocols of like radio frequencies and telecommunication. Uh, and for example, the telemetron, if we augment a little bit more the, pot the potential, the, the power of the radio frequency, you can have a performer in the vacuum, in, in actually the, the, the void of space, floating and transmitting everything that's happening there to a computer so people can listen to it in a more controlled environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, so one quick question just before we open up uh, Q&A for the audience. If you had to do it again, that possibly you will, uh, what will you change? What new things you are going to do? 
provided the experience that you have already. We're starting. I would change so many things, probably all of them. I don't know <laughs> what you said. Well, for me, I, I still have to, to fly with the Savnak, which is the prototype for, for painting in zero gravity. So I'm super excited of flying with, with, the, with the prototype. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, as any research, it's about trial and error. It's experimental. So in our case, with the telemetron or this line of spatial instruments or microgravity instruments, it's we need to do it again. We need to change a lot of things. And now that we actually know what works, what doesn't, we have like, I mean, to just name a few concrete things. Like, we want to try different instruments uh, for different like uh, expressions, uh, music, like sonic expressions, uh, different shapes. Uh, as like Mark was saying, like verticality. Even if it's like funny, because there's like this whole like that dichotomy of verticality on gravity, but in microgravity, actually controlling a vertical thing makes sense. Or maybe, yeah, so it, I don't know. It's, there's so many other things to test. Mm -hmm. So, do you have questions for Nicole, Albert, and Mark? If you have them, go ahead, over there. So, John Jenkins with NASA Ames Research Center. Um, do you have opportunities or plans to take the telematron to the International Space Station? Can you help me with that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would know. love to. I mean, that's like one of like the dreams of the telemetron or, or the new coming instruments. I, I do know the manager for the rodent habitat, and if you could shrink it down so that the rats could play it, then that's a possibility. I could. I totally yeah. could. <laughs> With micro times. A micro telemetron. <laughs> More questions? Don't be shy. Yeah, thanks a lot for this amazing project. Um, my question was, uh, did you inspire from actual real instruments? Because the telemetron reminds me a bit of a bell which has been closed. And uh, did you find instruments on Earth that actually work in uh, microgravity? That's a great question. Um, and I'm a little bit, like, to be super honest, I'm a little bit ashamed to say that I didn't really do that research that well, I guess you would have done it better in that sense. Um, I didn't really like, we didn't start the research of the telemetron of like, oh, we, ha we didn't even thought about bringing earthling instruments to microgravity as, as you did. I mean, so there's like, that's why it's interesting this collaboration with the zero gravity band because we have different approaches that are very complementary. Uh, but personally, we didn't do that research. We just went to like, what can we create? And of course, the telemetron as an instrument is this chamber with these times, that even times are instruments that we actually use on Earth. Mm -hmm. So it's, of course, very inspiring on things that we, we know. But as I said before, like the first kit is like, it's a very simple idea. Like really, really simple, very minimalistic. But it's just when you, when you actually deploy it and do it, it's, that's the magic of the, yeah. of the instrument. The instrument I use, the, the Hot Honey, is a wireless controller. You can buy it in Amazon. And actually, it works with three axes. Like, and it's so useful. And, and even you know, the company that they designed, they were amazed. Like, they never thought that they was, was going to use in, in zero gravity. So it, it works perfectly. It was really more useful than a normal keyboard or the groove box I used as well. Hi, I, I was curious about one thing. I was wondering as you were speaking this, that of course, this idea of the why that Antonia was suggesting has to do with the sheer fact that almost no one is going to be able to do this. It's like, I think that if I'm wrong now, there are like seven people in space, which is usually the crew of the International Space Station. We know space tourism is supposedly coming, but the space tourism is going to be for ultra millionaires. So it's not even for the 1%, it's going to mm. be for the 0 0.0001. So somebody could say like, but, but this is a problem that doesn't need a solution because the number of people... It, but, I, but I think about it in a different way, which is that this is really the start, or this could be the start of something that ends up revealing itself as the beginning of a process that takes 80 years, 100 years, 200 years for whatever the conditions are very different in the same way that the pioneers of electronic music in the 30s or 20s were imagining a wall, which is the wall of today, that they could never see. So I was curious to think if, if you feel like pioneers and if you think in terms of these long scales of time, because uh, we're not going to have solved this problem in 10 years, but maybe yes, in 200. 
can I, yes, um, th that's, that's a crucial question, actually, or a crucial, crucial reflection. And, and from, from a more academic point of view, I, of course, some people are, are going to say, okay, is this really valuable, like mid-term, long-term, this kind of research? And, and I'm saying that, or what, I, what I'm realizing now is that it's really impactful already in the very short term, because doing, in terms of cognitive science research, I'm talking right now, um, putting or trying to study this, co to study cognition with humans in these really out of normal uh, scenarios brings back lots of insights into the way cognition works here on Earth. Uh, so it's not about how humans are going to behave or what's happening in geogravity, but studying in those specific and special conditions condition it's bringing back us to us so much about what we are what's happening here on earth and is that that's my way also to to motivate doing doing this kind of projects it's like a double giving giving and, and receiving something back even more powerful unfortunately we have run out of time can i add something yeah that is like just because do. this is like for me my main motivation of this do. i'm sorry to do interrupt please you. do uh, to uh, add to that, like also like for me, uh, ah no! Apparently no, 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 we no. have more time. Oh, we have cool. more time. We yeah, have more was, time. Uh, oh yeah. my God, we can talk more. <laughs> Let's do it. So go that on, time Nicole. Is relative, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, to add on to that, uh, for me, for example, these projects are not, or or my work or or the art that we create, it's not really answering a problem. Uh, it's most opening questions, hmm. uh, in the sense that. Of course, we're maybe, maybe yes, maybe we are pioneers, but I don't care about that. Like, that's not what I'm working. Uh, what I'm really working for, it's, uh, and I think the guys are also like, we've, we've talked about this. It's more about how to open new narratives and like, yes, everything in space is like super elite. It's like super, like, man, like not even like 0.01, it's like nothing of humanity, right? It's like a problem that is like, why? Again, the question. But for me, the importance of this, doing these things is to actually create a work that create a narrative that is open for everybody. So that's like one of the objectives of the uh, MIT Media Lab Space uh, Exploration Initiative is to create a, a diversified uh, language communication. And like, for example, tomorrow I'm running this workshop, which is called Anti-Gravitational Luthiers. And it's not like to just create instruments for astronauts, but it's like so kids or anybody anywhere, different communities, they can actually approach and appropriate space, and not only for sm small elites, military, or rich people, but like kind of like the movement of like Afrofuturism. It's not about going to space, actually. It's about saying, hey, you very little elites, you're not the only ones that have access to this. So I think it's super important. And as like one of my personal heroes, Donna Haraway says, we need to tell the stories that tell stories. And that's only like for opening new narratives and create like a diversify everything present. I really like the name of the workshop. I love it. Because actually gravi gravity, it's, when we talk about space, it's so important to talk about gravity because gravi gravitational waves is a huge theme in astrophysics, cosmos. It would hit so hard in the next century. So talk about space is so important as well. Talk about gravity, like how a black hole, uh, use this gravitational wave that we cannot see, that it's so hard for scientists. So I think talking about space in art or anything has to be attached in certain point to, to gravity. So I think it's an important statement in all the investigation of researchers. Mm -hmm. uh, more questions? We have time for a few more. Hi there. Um, you, you, <coughs> you touched on the... Um, the, the space tourism entrepreneurs like Virgin Galactic and uh, Elon Musk and things. I wonder if um, you've given any thought to presenting your, uh, your research and your projects to uh, organizations such as them and seeing if there would be any potential for them to support you because if they're trying to inspire people, they're trying to inspire, you know, obviously the super rich first, but, but all of us as to the, the potential for being, for being in space and the things we can achieve in space. And, and this strikes me as a, a wonderful thing to, in, to uh, inspire people's imagination as to the creative potential of space. N not us? Do you work there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid not, no. <laughs> so, no, well, no. We didn't present to any 
like big company like those yet, no? But I don't know if Nicole. Yeah. Nicole, Very what about no, you? We, we, we did is is it something you would give thought to, or is it something you might be opposed to? I, I don't want to say anything because my collaborator is not here. <laughs> Personally, I might not be too inclined to do so. Like I try, I don't know. It's it's a it's a tough one. I mean, maybe having the resources to to develop further projects is it's it's important uh, and needed. But in the other hand, uh, there's a few things that I really I, I'm not like I'm, I'm not very aligned with my personal interests and feelings or politics. I mean, it must be incredibly expensive to experiment in zero gravity, would that be? <laughs> it is, it yeah. is. It yeah. is, indeed. Actually, like, yeah, it is. Um, and in my case, we're like super lucky to be part of, uh, have this uh, space uh, exploration initiative that support us with this research. Um, and the guys are working with Quartis. Uh, Quartis, and also the, we're from Moyerusa, a small city that helps you a lot. Here and in Catalonia. Yeah, in Catalonia. And Yeda helps us a lot that they believe a lot in the project. So I think it's important to find partners, but it's also important to find the right partners for whatever, anything, to anything we do, right? Like so. Thank you. More questions? No one? No one? So I'm going to ask you one because we have time and I want to use, I want to squeeze okay. every bit of time that we have. Uh, so for the future, you, Albert, you still have to try your, uh, S I, I, I don't even know how to say it. Uh, so I guess that you are not thinking about further prototypes, but Mark, you have tried with the keyboards, you have tried with the boomba, with a rhythm box, where you've tried with this device. Are you thinking about prototypes that you will try in other flights that you no, will do? We actually try to create, a, I have ideas, a sketches, draws. So we started our collaboration with a university in, in, in Barcelona, but he didn't have time to, to create the instruments. But I have in mind a few instruments that I said, I, I want to create a, a vertical piano that will be more useful to, to play it. But it, it has twice input, twice important parts. One is to create the instrument and then to learn and distribute the, the elements, how to play it. So it's, it's a huge. One of the things we always say with the bird, like zero gravity band is not a closed band. We just want to share a message. Like Nicole, come on, or engineer, or we scientific. We want it to be an orchestra. Yeah, yeah, you want to join. Like, come on, give ideas, give us a mail. Uh, it's like the same of Nicole. I was calling an engineer that I, he knows me, and say, and I told them before the project was public, when it was private, I said, I want to create the first universal piano. So I want to play, create a piano that if I bring the piano in Mars, auto compensates the gravity to, to put the, gravity ne the extra gravity necessary to, to play like in, in Earth. So I can take this piano in different planets and create it. And the first thing he said, uh, Mark, are you drunk? Mm -hmm. I just smoke some because, f for you know, but that is always the fair reaction. But then when they realize, like, oh, well, this is so cool, yeah, I think, no, no, you know, you can do these elements. So if any one of you, like Nicole, when we found Nicole, we were extremely happy, almost crying, like, wow, so cool, come on. And you, Nicole, do you have any any thoughts about the new instruments that you want to try out in space? Yes. Yeah, totally. Yes. I mean. How are they? Yeah, next time I'm not bringing one. I'm, 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 yes, I'm going to feel all the paperwork for many, and it, I think it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, different shapes, different types of things. Like, not only, not only the times, not only different geometries, but different sensors uh, and different ways of interacting with them, different materialities. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, the it's, there's so many constraints for a zero-gravity flight, as I was saying. There, there's a lot of like, technical things, uh, safety issues. But yeah, why not fluids? Like it's, which is like the most like yeah. hard thing to get approval for, but, but it's, it's worth it. So, and she yeah. said something important, safety, because in, in these flights, they are so strict with rules, yeah. extremely. Mm -hmm. So what you can do now, yes, we are running out of time. Not, yes, now we are in the red. Uh, you can check the installation zero gravity band, which is in the, in the building sideways to this one, and then you can participate uh, in Nicole's workshop, Anti-Gravitational Luthiers, uh, tomorrow. And now I just want to say thank you to Albert, to Mark, and to Nicole for sharing with us uh, their projects, to tell us how you've made it, and to be present here with us, and 
trusting us to present your projects here. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Antonia. Thank you, Antonia. Thank you everybody. Thank you.